I'm Bob McDonald, and I'm curious about everything, about why things are the way they are, why I have to keep pedaling so hard to make these light bulbs work, and I'm sure you're curious too or you wouldn't be here. Good science is good questions, so let's ask some good questions and see what kind of answers we get. Why is a comet like a dirty snowball? What determines the shape of a beluga whale, or a dolphin for that matter? And what about UFOs? Are they for real? The answers are coming up. But first, let's see what happens when you apply scientific methods to pure fantasy. Sometimes scientists don't have very much to work with when they're trying to put together their theories. Uh, for example, an astronomer has nothing more than light to work with. It comes down from the stars through his telescope, but that's all he's got, and yet he's got to try to figure out from that what a star is like, how big it is, how hot it is, how far away it is. An archaeologist might have a piece of clay pottery or, a, or some statue, and they have to figure out what was civilization like thousands of years ago. This process is called inferring, and it's kind of like having a jigsaw puzzle, but you don't have all the pieces. You're trying to figure out what the puzzle is like, what the picture's like. Well, I'd like you to try some of this inferring, only instead of being scientists, I'd like you to stretch your imagination. I'd like you to imagine that you are an alien from another world, and you've come here to Earth, you've never been to the Earth before, you don't look like an Earthling, you look like something totally different. Maybe you look like cooked cabbage, but you're smart. You know how to get here, so you know about space travel, you must know something about technology, and you must know something about science. So here you are exploring around this planet, looking at everything. You've never seen grass, you've never seen trees. We've hidden in the woods here somewhere a piece of technology that was built by humans. You find this. You don't know what humans look like, but you've got to try to figure out what does the creature look like that built this or that would use this thing. So let's take a walk through the woods and remember, you have a very different alien perspective on this planet. What do you think the creature looks like that uses this thing? It has a weird bottom. There's a small thing on over here and there's a big thing over here. Yeah, and there's two more over on this side that are the same. So it must have been four something. Two and two. Four legs? It must have had huge hands. Yeah, but what do you think the hands look like to, to run this, this thing? Probably had long fingers, very long so they could curl over it. Uh -huh. uh, look, there are things in there that look like us. There must be people in there. These creatures must only see forward. You can't see backwards. They need these things to help them look backwards. They don't have eyes on their heads like our cousins do. OK, suppose we get adventurous. If you, as aliens, looked inside this, you might recognize the computer. I mean, do you think you'd know about computers? How do you think we came here? Well, yeah, of course. <laughs> you might know something about computers to have to travel in space. <laughs> Here, I'll give you another clue here. What that. The... Whoa! Oh, eggs. <laughs> Whoa! What's they have here? eggs, man. These guys have huge eggs. <laughs> and All little right. hands. This stuff is very interesting because it's it's sort of soft and, and it's very organic. It's it's not it's not like the any any of the other stuff. Maybe that's their their really them. Maybe this these are parts of their body. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's see what's what's inside this part here. This is bright stuff. Whoa! Whoa. This must be his clothing. Okay, we're getting some clues now, though, as to what they might look like. Okay, wait a minute. I got it. I got it. This goes on. This goes on here. Oh, the other one goes on here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Right? Yeah. right? That goes on there. And this, this is the bottom. Look, let's put it over here. See, look, we'll get it. We got it. This is the creature. We got it. We got it figured out. It, it goes like that over the two and then they're, they're very high like uh, you know they can look around like this that's it by the way the reason i have to work so hard to keep these light bulbs lit is because electricity is energy and if you want to generate energy you got to spend energy and in this case it happens to be the energy of my muscles makes a champion. We have a real athlete here in the pool with us today. We tend to think of 
athletes, or rather, we tend to think of champions as those that are the biggest and the fastest and the best. And there's no doubt about it that the dolphin is that. She's 200 pounds of muscle. She's shaped like a torpedo. She can blast through the water with incredible speed with all her muscles working her tail. Now, while she looks like a fish, she's not a fish. She's a warm-blooded, air-breathing mammal. And there's no question, she's one of the best. But you know, she can leap, she can swim at incredible speeds, not for our benefit, but because that's what she's designed to do in the wild. If she couldn't do that, she could never catch the fish that she preys upon in the open ocean. You see, she lives out in the open ocean and she feeds on fast-moving open water prey. And so she's designed to do that. Consequently, she can leap out of the water and do all kinds of tremendously athletic things. Now, on the other hand, we have the beluga whale. She doesn't look much like an athlete. She's big, and she's white, and she's very fat. She couldn't leap out of water if her life depended on it. But in the world that she lives in, which is the northern cold Arctic waters, she does extremely well. She needs all that fat to keep her warm. She can't have fur underwater. Once fur gets wet, it doesn't work. Not only that, she hasn't uh, got a lot of things on her body that would help her lose heat. So she has small pectoral fins. She has no dorsal fin like the dolphin has. She has small tail flukes. And all of these things are designed to help her keep warm in the area that she lives. She doesn't have to move quickly like the dolphin does because she feeds on slow-moving fish that live on the bottom or she snuffles around in the mud for shrimps and clams. But in the area that she lives in, she does extremely well. So what makes a champion? A champion in the natural world is the animal that is best suited for the life that it leads. Every year, thousands of Canadian children disappear. They're called missing kids. Usually, 99.9% .9 of them are found within 24 hours. They got mad at their parents and went to a friend's house, or they forgot to tell their parents where they were going. But a few remain missing, and very few remain missing for many years. Well, the problem is that we all change as we grow up, and it's difficult to know what someone's going to look like if they've been missing for five or ten years. If you look at your baby pictures, you can see how much you've changed. I know I have. Sean McCutcheon was two and a half when he disappeared ten years ago. Now he's twelve, and he must look very different. The police asked Betty Clark, an artist from Pickering, Ontario, to try and draw Sean as he might look today. We inherit our features from both our blood parents and sometimes grandparents. Aging pictures is a science as well as art. Both the father and the son have deep set eyes. Uh, there is no discernible eyelid in either one of them. The father said that the, the son looked a lot like him. So my best bet was to get the father's face and work backwards in age to um, get to uh, the child's present age about 12 and a half. And the first picture I did was this one, which I figure was about 15 years old, as the father would have looked, and perhaps as Sean will look as, when he's that age.